Please pray with me. Dear Jesus, thank you for everything that you have created. Help the speaker to um, have a good story and for everybody to um, be paid attention and everything. And thank you for all the friends that we've made and, and thank you for the school and the church. Help all of us to have a great day today. Amen. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you for this whole school, school community. Thank you that Mr. Reynolds is to come with us through Zoom. Please hope all this week to go well. Amen. Goodbye, Pastor John. We'll miss you. Thank you so much for all you've done here at Athelton. Don't be a stranger. Goodbye, Pastor John. But I know the Lord has a new plan for you. We'll miss you, Pastor John! Bye! We'll miss you, Pastor John! Thank you for remembering everyone's names. Hi, Pastor John. Uh, we just want to say that we enjoyed your time here with Athelton. Uh, we've done a lot of fun things, but moreover, we enjoyed your friendship. From basketball to volleyball to even climbing together. So I would like to end this with simply two words. Play pen. Play pen. All right. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye, Pastor John. You've enriched our lives. Thank you. <laughs> we will miss you, Pastor John. Thank you for being a caring person. We are glad we get to keep Sophia. We will miss you. God bless you, Pastor John. We will miss you, Pastor John. May God bless you. John, I have truly been blessed that you have not allowed the glass doors between your office and mine stand in the way of many good conversations and many shared ministry experiences over the last five years. God bless. On behalf of the sixth grade class, we just wanted you to know how much we love you. We are going to miss you. 
We're going to miss seeing your smile in the hallways every day and the different greetings that you give us. God bless you and your family as you guys move to Ellicott City. Bye. Bye. You are you do great stories about Jesus. We love you. We love your stories. You are a great pastor. We love you no matter what. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. We hope Pastor John has a safe ride to his new job. And we hope God stays with him no matter what. And we hope he gets no injury. Amen. We invite you to sing with us the song, I Love You, Lord. I love you, Lord, and I lift my eyes to worship. joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your Psalms 91, verses 14 through 16. Please join in to read together. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. Mrs. Reynolds, we are so glad that you get to join us for one less, one last chapel period here today. May God richly bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am glad to be here. And I'm sorry it's the end of the week. I brought my knife along with me today because I need it for my apple. So I'm going to cut my apple open. And I'm going to look inside. Something's falling out already. What's that? Yeah, it's a little seed. And if I keep cutting my apple, oh, there goes another one. <laughs> I'm going to find more seeds. Can I count how many seeds are in my apple? Sure. I could dig around in here and, oh, there goes some more. Well, so far I have four. No, oh, there's another one right in there. Yeah, I could count all the apples. Oh, I have only one apple. 
I could count all the seeds in my apple. Hmm. Can I count how many apples are in my seeds? Huh. A young couple by the name of David and Sevea went to Africa from the country of Sweden. They joined up with another young couple, the Ericsons, and they went to the country of the Congo. The Belgian Congo is considered the heart of Africa. Now, when they got there at the mission station, they were all living at the mission station in the floods. And the Erickson said, we don't want to just live at the mission station. We want to go out. We want to go to the villages and touch and reach the people there. So hmm, this was 1921. Africa, believe me, was not very developed in 1921, a uh, hundred years ago. Huh? But they had to hack their way in places, make a road to get to the village. They came to one. And in this village, um, the, the chief said, you're not going to come here. Now, he had not ever seen white people. And he said, if I bring you into my village, our gods may be quite angry with us. So you may not enter our village. They went to another village. And again, the same thing. But they decided they weren't going to leave. So they went up on the side of the mountain and the four of them hacked out an area in the jungle for the Congo is a very jungly area. And they made mud huts. The people stayed far away from them, but you can believe they were watching everything the floods and the Ericsons did. Well, they made a garden. The village allowed one little boy, a small child, only five years of age, to come to their little huts two or three times a week. They brought eggs, this little boy, sorry, the little boy brought to them eggs and chickens to sell to them. And he would come back every day and tell the villagers what they had said, what he had seen. He was the one. So this was his job to tell everyone. He would come again. Now, Savea Flood, a tiny little woman, only four foot eight. So that's about, it's about six inches shorter than Mrs. V. That's pretty short. She thought to herself, hmm, if this is the only African I'm going to get to see, then I'm going to preach to him. I'm going to tell him the stories of Jesus because I came to the Congo to tell about Jesus. So every time this little five-year-old boy came, she would tell him something new about Jesus. And that little boy would go back to the village and he would tell the villagers what he had learned. He did not always get a very good reception. And so pretty soon, that woman, Miss Savea, would tell him those things and he would keep them in his heart. But he never forgot. Now, something else you need to know about the jungles of Africa is they have lots of mosquitoes. And from personal testimony, I can tell you those mosquito bites can leave giant welts on your skin. Luckily, where I lived in Zimbabwe, we did not have malaria. But in the Congo in 1921, there was lots of malaria. And all four of those missionaries got malaria, not one time, not two, but several times. Malaria is a terrible disease. It gives you high, high temperature and chills and it slowly zaps your strength. And that's what happened to those four people. After about six or eight months, the Erickson says, forget it, we're not living here any longer. What are we doing here anyway? We're not being able to preach about Jesus. We're leaving. And the Ericsons left, went back to the mission station, leaving the floods there to continue on the work. What was the work? Talking to a little five-year-old boy two or three times a week, but they carried on. After the Ericsons left, about a year later, Savea found out she was going to have a baby. At first, she was very excited. You see, they had a two-year-old boy, little David, that they had brought with them. And they loved him so much. And they enjoyed having this little family. It'd be great to have it grow. And then she thought, here, here, in, in, in the middle of nowhere, I'm going to have a baby. So it kind of scared her. But the baby grew. And every day... 
that the little boy came from the village, she would teach about Jesus. They worked in their garden. That was their existence. Savea kept getting malaria. Sometimes it recurs without a mosquito biting you just because it's in your system. By the time it was for her baby to be born, she was not strong at all. But the little boy went back to the village and told the chief, you must give her help. And his heart softened enough to let a midwife come to help Savea have her baby. And her little baby was born, a little girl, but oh, it was a difficult, difficult birth. And after 17 days, Miss Savea died, leaving that little tiny baby, a two-year-old boy, well, three by now, three-year-old boy, and her husband in the heart of Africa alone. And something snapped inside the brain of David Flood. What has God done to me, he thought. He packed up what little bit he could carry. He did go to the village, not allowed inside, but he asked for some helpers. Two or three men came. To one of them, he gave the baby. You carry this baby. To another one, he said, you help this boy. I'm leaving. And they guided him back to the mission station. When he got to the mission station, he found the Ericsons. He took the baby and gave it to Mrs. Erickson. And he snarled, I'm leaving this continent. God has ruined my life. I can't care for a baby. You care for her. I will take my son. And he left. Went to the nearest port. Sailed to Sweden. He was done. The Ericsons suddenly had a baby. Well, they cared for that baby as best they could. They loved that baby as best they could. But in eight months' time, the story is that the local people poisoned them, and they died. Here was the baby at the mission station. There was another couple, an American couple. We'll take the baby. We don't have any children. And so the Berg family took this little baby, Anna. What a lovely baby she was. But they said, we want to give her an American name. And they gave her the name Aggie. Hmm, I like Anna better, but her name was Aggie. Aggie lived there with them at the mission station for three more years. In fact, they traveled to some other places. She got to live in different places. But by the time she was three and they left, she didn't remember a whole lot after many years. They went back to America on furlough and they were going to stay for just one year. In those days, you got to stay for a year to see your family and go to school and then go back to your mission station. But when it was time, Mr. and Mrs. Berg said, wait a minute. We don't have any legal papers that say this baby belongs to us. Suppose we go over there or we start to go over there and people start asking questions. Could they take our baby away? No, 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 no. We don't want to risk that. So they decided they would stay in America. So Aggie, who had been born in Africa, was now raised in South Dakota. And as she was being raised, her mom and dad would tell her every now and again about her family back in, well, where, where was their family? Her mother was buried in the Congo. But what happened to her father? Her mother helped her write letters. They sent them to Sweden, trying to find her dad. But all those letters were either sent back or lost. She never did find her father. And, and she knew that she, she loved the Bergs. They were wonderful parents, but she really wished she could find her real daddy. She really wished she could hear more stories about her mama. And, and am I American? Am I Swedish? Am I African? She would sometimes ask herself. She grew up. She went to a Bible college. And at the Bible college, she met the man of her dreams, Dewey. So Aggie and Dewey got married. And he was a pastor teacher. That little boy, that little girl, but always in the back of her mind. I wish I could find my real dad. And so every once in a while, she'd write another letter, send it off to Sweden, trying to find your dad. Either it would come back or it would be lost. Nothing. Well, her pastor husband 
got to be a really good teacher and very well known. And they asked him to move to Seattle, Washington. Oh, she loved Seattle. It was so beautiful, so green. She really liked it out there. However, she discovered that there were a lot of Scandinavian people. Now, you upper graders know Scandinavian people are from uh huh, Sweden, Norway, Finland. Yeah, right. That's called Scandinavia. And she liked that because there were many people with blonde hair and blue eyes, such as she had. But she didn't know anything more, really, about them. One day she went out to the mailbox and she opened the mailbox up and there was a magazine in there. Funny. This is all in a different language. Oh, I think it's Swedish. She could recognize the lettering. And as she was looking through it, a picture caught her eye. A picture of a grave, just a simple grave with a white cross over it. But on the cross were two words that she knew, Savea flood. <gasps> That's my mother. That's my mother. She ran in the house, got her car keys, jumped in the car, raced across campus to a professor that she knew read Swedish. She ran in his office, threw a down in front of him. Read this, read this. Tell me what it says. Slow down, slow down. No, no, I can't slow down. Tell me what it says. All right, all right. He picked it up. He began to survey. He goes, okay. It talks about a missionary couple who went to the Congo and they had a baby and the woman died. And, and this, is, this is her grave right here in the picture. And there was a little boy that, what, what? Okay, tell me more. Slow down. There was a little boy who sold them eggs and chickens. And the little boy listened to the stories and the little boy became a Christian. And the little boy convinced the chief to let him have a school. And in the school, he taught the children about Jesus. And all the children went home and taught their parents about Jesus. And da 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 da. Oh, no, da 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 da. She said, Tell me everything. All right, all right. The people in the village became Christians. Even the chief became a Christian. And basically now there's 600 Christians in that little village. What? All because of my mother? My mother and my father? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what it said. She was overjoyed, as you can imagine. Well, she tried writing again to her father. Nothing. Now the story went all over campus. Everybody heard about her mother. It was so exciting. And unbeknownst to her... The people on campus started raising money, raising money. And on her and Dewey's 25th wedding anniversary, they gave her enough money to pay for airfare to Sweden, to pay for hotels in Sweden, to cover everything in Sweden. And it wasn't long before they left. When she got there, it took her about seven to 10 days, but she found her not her father, but she found her siblings. You see, David Flood had gone back to Sweden, had four more children after he got married, and he still had David. She found them. It was so exciting. It was, they hugged and they, and they laughed and they talked. And she said, I want to see father. And they put her off. I want to see father. And they put her off. Finally, she stopped everything. And she said, I want to see my father. All right but you won't like it. Well, some of them were not very happy about this father of theirs. They did not have a good relationship, but she said, I must see him. All right, but know something. He won't want to talk to you, number one. Number two, he's a drunk. Number three, he lives in a horrid apartment. This word they use was squalid. Some of you upper graders may know what that means. It was dirty. There were, well, anyway, when she went and opened up that apartment door, the first thing was the smell. She looked around. There were liquor bottles all over. But across the room in a bed, there was a shrunken little old man. He had been sick. He had had a stroke. He was not clean. But she knew he was her father. She went across and she said, Papa, Papa, who are you? I'm Anna. I'm your little girl. 
I'm Anna. My, my Anna? Yes, Papa. She knelt down next to him and he began to cry. And he said, I didn't mean to give you away. I really didn't mean to give you away. She put her arms around him and she held him to her. She didn't care what he smelled like. She didn't care how dirty he was. He was her papa. And she hugged him. Oh, Papa, I'm so sorry, he told her. I'm so sorry. No, Papa, it's okay. God took care of me. The tears stopped. He stiffened and he turned himself away from her. Facing the wall. Anna leaned in, and as she choked, stroked his cheek, she said, Papa, I have a story for you. Now listen to it, because it's a true story. It's a story of a man and a woman who went to the Congo, who loved Jesus, who told a little boy, and that little boy loved Jesus too. And when Mama, that's who the story's about, Papa, because you know. When mama died, that little boy kept the stories of Jesus in his heart. And as he grew up, he told everybody, and Papa, Papa, there are 600 people who love Jesus because you and mama went to Africa. Oh, Papa, Jesus doesn't hate you. God didn't ruin your life. Yes, he did. God did this to me. No, Papa. God loves you. And God wants you to come back to him. He turned to her and he looked at her face. He could hardly believe it. They spent the rest of the afternoon together. Crying, I'm sure. Talking. But before Aggie, Anna, left that day, David Flood gave his life back to God. That should be the end of the story, but it's not. Because Aggie and Dewey went back to America. Within a few short weeks, she got word that her papa had passed away. But she was okay with it because now she knew that her mama and her daddy had died loving Jesus. Not very long after that, her husband was invited to go to a conference. And this time, their way was paid to London. And as they said in this conference, like, like we have general conferences in our church, they sat there and they listened. As many people spoke, and an African man came up. And they said he was from the Congo. Oh, she thought. Is it the Belgian Congo? Yes. All right. He's from my country, she told her husband. And he just smiled. And as he talked, he talked about how many people there were, how in his village, there had been no one, but a couple had come and, and, and they had talked about Jesus. And now his, his little village had, had grown to 600, 600 members. And then how they had gone and told other villages. And now there were 110,000 members in the Congo who followed God. Aggie said, wait a minute, this story sounds a little familiar. So she jumped up when he got done and she raced up there and she said, um, I have a question for you. Do you know the names David and Savea Flood? Oh, yes, I do. They were the missionaries that came to my village. How do you know them? I am David and Savea's daughter. I was born there. What? And he reached out and gave her a giant hug and he began to cry. He said, I'm the little boy. I'm the little boy that sold them eggs and chickens. And he says, I remember when you were born. He said, oh, you must come to Africa. You must come to my village because there is your mother's grave. And I want you to know your mama is the most important woman in our history. And we decorate her grave and we honor her. Oh, you must come and see. <laughs> well, you can imagine it didn't take Dewey and Aggie Long to raise enough money to go to Africa. And he met her there and he took her. He took her to the place where their little mud hut was still standing. And he took her to the place where her mama's grave was. And she cried as she knelt and she prayed, oh, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much that my mama and my papa were little seeds, little seeds here in the Congo. 
And as those people gave her honor, she thought of a verse. And I'm going to read it to you. It's in Matthew. It's the parable of the sower. And here it says that some of the seeds fell by the wayside. Some fell on stony places. And some fell among thorns. And the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. All the seeds grew. You can count the number of seeds in an apple, but you can't count the number of apples in a seed because you never know if that crop is going to be 30, 60, 600, or 110,000. <laughs> you don't know, but God does. David and Sevea Flood gave their hearts to Jesus. They were overwhelmed with his love. They left the comfort of their home to go to the wilds of Africa. Not an easy choice. There they suffered from many things. And Sevea gave her life. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. They were delivered from many things, were they not? And the Ericsons? I will set him on high. I will honor him because he has known my name. Was Sevea Flood honored? Oh my, yes. I will be with him in trouble. Was Jesus with them through their troubles? Did David recognize Jesus being with them? No, he didn't. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Did Sevea Flood have a long life? My first answer, yours is too. No, she was only 27 when she died. But yes, she did have a long life. For I'm sure, and I would love to do this, if we went to the Congo, oh, we would have to buy a ticket for Zaire. For Zaire is the name of that place now. If we were to buy a ticket and go to Zaire, I am confident we would find Sevea Flood's Grave marking still there. And we would still find the people of God giving her honor. My dears, this week we have talked about many different things. Are you brave enough to follow Jesus? Are you brave enough to love the unlovable as Jonathan did? Are you brave enough to stand for the right as Eric Little did? Are you brave enough to help others? Put them first, as Arlen Williams did. And are you brave enough to follow Jesus, as David and Sevea Flood did, even giving of their lives? That is what Jesus calls you to do today, to have the greatest joy in your life you could ever have, to put Jesus Christ as number one in your life. It is the greatest honor for us to give ourselves to Jesus. And all along through our lives, Jesus has been guiding us. Some of us were born in not very good circumstances. Some of us had people in our lives that, that didn't always take good care of us. But Jesus was always there. And he's been leading you every step of the way to where you are now. And many of you, as you look back in life, you could find times when, yeah, Jesus really did took care, take care of me. Jesus really was speaking to me. And today he's speaking to you again. He says, I want you. I want all of you, not just part of your heart. I want your whole heart and mind and soul. So today in your rooms, your teachers have these cards. It's called the Ethelton Decision Card. And if your teacher hasn't handed them out yet, they're going to right now. And as you look at those cards, I want you to think, this card is Jesus talking to me. This is Jesus saying, I want you to be brave. Oh, brave in Jesus. It's not me being brave. It's Jesus <laughs> giving me courage. It's Jesus giving me bravery. It wasn't Eric Little all by himself. It was Jesus in Eric Little. It was God in Jonathan. It was the love of God 
the spirit of the Holy, the Holy Spirit in David and Savea Flood and Arlen Williams. The choice to be brave in Jesus <laughs> is given from Jesus. The courage to make that choice is given in Jesus. I choose to make choices every day that are brave in Jesus. If I had this card, and I, I have a copy of it right here in front of me, I would mark that. I choose to be brave in Jesus every day. And those choices are from Jesus' bravery. I want to be brave in Jesus by preparing for baptism. Baptism, giving myself totally to God and letting other people know that. Maybe I've already been baptized, and I have. But I want to pray for my friends that they will make that decision. I want to help God by helping others to be brave. It's not easy always to be brave. Sometimes we need to link arms, link hands, and say, yes, we can do this together in Christ. That joy we have in Jesus, Jesus first, other second, well, you're my other. Let me work with you. I can help you to be brave. And I'm looking for service opportunities ASAP. That means as soon as possible, I want to do something to help others. So I pray that as you hold this decision card and as you mark your choices, you'll be honest with Jesus. You'll let him work in your heart, in your mind, on your life to be brave in Christ. Oh, you're going to make mistakes. Yeah, I've made mistakes already this week. Day number one, I made mistakes, even in talking to you. But that's okay. Because Jesus takes those mistakes and he covers them with his blood. Remember that red from the very first day? Yeah, that's the blood of Jesus. And he says, forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. And now he looks at you and he says, I don't see you. I see Jesus in you every day. Jesus in you. I want to pray with you right now. So let's bow our heads. I see some still walking around. I'll wait a moment. Do you find a place to settle? Let's bow our heads. Let's talk to the Lord. Dear Father in heaven, this week we have talked about being brave in Jesus. We have talked about loving others. We have talked about your love for us. We have talked about serving others. We have talked about standing for the right, because that's standing for you. Father, today these young people have held this card in their hands. They're making choices. I pray that each one, even all the way down to the itty-bitty ones in the pre-kindergarten, will give their hearts to you today. Ah, oh, you love us so more, so much. We cannot, we cannot comprehend it. We're overwhelmed with your love for us. But we want to overwhelm you. We at Athleton this morning want to overwhelm the courts of heaven with our love for you, Jesus. As we mark these cards, as we sing praises to you, as we go about our schoolwork, our interactions, may our love be seen in heaven and may the angels rejoice with us because we love you and because Jesus loves us. I pray the Holy Spirit upon each teacher, each staff member, that they will have the love of Christ be seen in their words, in their actions, in their faces. And I pray for each child that together we may serve you and honor you as you have honored us. And may we meet together in heaven very, very soon. We know we can pray this way boldly because of what Jesus has done for us and what Jesus will continue to do for us because of his great name, his great glory. God the Father, we honor you today. Amen.